So hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the What The Finance podcast and on today's episode I am happy to be hosting Christopher Volk. So Chris has been instrumental in leading and publicly listing three successful companies, two of which he co-founded, uh, with the most recent being Store Capital, uh, which was listed on New York, York Stock Exchange, where he served as founding chief executive officer and then as exec- executive chairman. Uh, so Chris is also the author of the upcoming book, The Value Equation, A Business Guide to Creating Wealth for Entrepreneurs, Investors and Business Business leaders, which is available in May 10th uh, this year. So Chris, thanks for joining the podcast. And just my first question, what was your influence for writing the book? Um, the influence, the book stems from just articles I've done over my entire career. So uh, in, <clears throat> in late, uh, you know, before the, before the millennium. So, so in 1999, I, I wrote an article uh, uh, that, that was called the V formula, which is really the value equation. And it breaks down business into uh, just a few variables. Um, and, uh, and I really, uh, uh, the article was simple. It, it won an award. So it was, a, it, it was one of the better things I've written, but, but it, um, uh, it had a lot of implications that I ended up drawing on later on. And then uh, ultimately when I was leading Store Capital, the latest company that I, I co-founded, I, I actually put a se- series of videos on the, on the website. And some of those videos are still there. So if you if you go onto Store's website, you can actually see them, and uh, uh, and they'll go through sort of ten lessons on on business, and and they'll use the value equation as kind of the centerpiece for that. And uh, ultimately, one day, a publisher called me up and said, "You know, you should write a book." And I said, "Well, um, okay." And two years later, of course, um, I started writing a book, and I started doing it during the pandemic in 2020 because none of us were taking any vacation, and we were all um, cooped up at home and. I uh, wanted to do something positive with my experience. So I, I wrote the bulk of the book in 2020. And then last year, I uh, had so many people proof it and uh, make comments. And I made additions to it. And I, I taught a class, a university class, where I uh, used a lot of the content to test out on university students to see what they thought of it. And, um, uh, and they were uh, uh, kindly, uh, brutally honest. And, um, uh, and so you know, all this made, I think, the, the book a better book and, and me a better writer to do that. And, and, um, uh, and then uh, Wiley agreed to publish it. And, um, uh, and I've been really fortunate to have the endorsements of uh, you know, various investors that we've had in, in, at, at store, including um, uh, Josh Brown from Ritholtz Wealth Management. He's uh, a panelist on CNBC Power Lunch for people who watch that kind of thing. Um, and uh, we were uh, a real estate investment, investment trust, and we uh, were fortunate to garner uh, Berkshire Hathaway, which is uh, Warren Buffett, to, to own almost 10% of the company. And so uh, Ted Wexler, who's a uh, uh, leading manager there, wrote a nice endorsement, and I have other endorsements on the book. So if people have been really supportive of the project, and um, uh, and it's a really it's a different way of looking at business. And I mean, it's I think it's rare to be able to uh, be able to write a book. I feel honored to be able to write a book where uh, the perspective is different from what most people have seen so far. Yeah. And I found that really interesting. How, how did the students f- find the book? And, and I guess the, the information, because I guess a, a lot of them are maybe interested in Bitcoin and more like the growth stocks, whereas this is more looking at the actual value of a company. So what was their opinion on that? Yeah. Well, I mean, um, you know, I think that they like the simplicity of it. I mean, uh, you know, I started like my life as a commercial banker and I used to model companies out and, and uh, starting with the earliest spreadsheet software out there to um, obviously Excel today. And, and I used to build very complicated models. And um, uh, ultimately, I just started to simplify models. And uh, I found that you could really model a business in as few as six variables. Um, and, and so uh, the six variables became the value equation. And you basically toss away the spreadsheet. Um, and, uh, and then if you you know, take those variables, it's actually possible to get rid of the numbers. So you can just focus on relationships. So it doesn't really matter what revenues are and, and, and uh, 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 what investment is and how much your uh, company is financed. You can actually use just relative numbers for all of this and create universal business truths out of it. And, um, uh, and so I think that uh, taking a relative approach instead of an absolute approach, which is so often taught in business school and, and finance, um, just makes things a lot easier and it makes it easier to tell people how to value a business, um, <clears throat> you know, how to uh, put together a capital stack, you know, how to minimize opportunity costs. And, and really what the, the, the um, for me, what the important thing is, 
is there are a lot of books out there that are written and, and guide people on how to, how to become rich. I mean, uh, there's, uh, there are a few popular, more popular books than those that tell people how to get rich. But the richest people in the world uh, throughout history have made their money uh, in business. Um, and, uh, and if you look at the Forbes 400 today or you look at the world's wealthiest people, without exception, they made their money in business. And, uh, and the way they made their money in business was by making the companies that they started uh, worth more than they cost to create. And most of the world's businesses do not rise to this level. It's, it's, a, uh, it's a rare thing to be able to actually create a company and then have it be worth more than a cost uh, to, to create. And if you can do that, you can create money from, from thin air. And, and, the, and the most wealthy people in the world have been able to do that. And so uh, what the value equation does is it guides you through how that, how that happens because it's a, very, it's a financial construct to be able to do that. And um, uh, so if people are reading this and saying, okay, well, how did the richest people get there? This book will sort of tell you how they got there and uh, and what it takes to, to to be among them. Yeah, and I found it interesting. The book you mentioned how it's more likely to become a billionaire than you are to win the lottery and <laughs> to be like a golf a professional golfer and all these different things. Oh no, it's an amazing thing. I mean, and I I was looking up for tennis statistics too because uh, I think tennis is even worse than professional golf. So um, uh, so as you're as you're thinking about how many billionaires or something, uh, well, globally there are. Uh, you know, I think close to 3,000 billionaires, something like that. Let's say 2,900. And um, uh, and uh, if you were looking at the uh, world golf rankings or the world golf players and say, what what is the lifetime earnings of somebody who ranks 3,000 in the world in golf? Um, it's almost nothing to speak of. So so in fact, sometimes these pro athletes are actually more of a unicorn than uh, the people that uh, uh, found these companies. Uh, I mean, the skills to take. Uh, um, to, to be able to win the Masters or whatever is just incredible. And, um, uh, and tennis is even uh, more difficult, I think. Um, uh, so, yeah, I mean, becoming um, uh, a billionaire is actually statistically easier than becoming a top pro golfer. Um, but it's, you know, becoming a uh, wealthy person through business, forgetting being a billionaire, because what it takes to you – know, what constitutes a win is far south of that. I mean um, – uh, and, uh, and, and it's broadly attainable for people today. And, uh, and in the countries that we're fortunate to live in, there's so much uh, more capital formation than there was when I started my career in terms of uh, private equity capital and venture capital and uh, people interested in starting businesses. There's a kind of a, a very strong interest in entrepreneurship. And most uh, uh, universities have a bent on inter- entrepreneurship and, uh, and, and teaching it. And and so I think that being able to, to join the ranks of uh, the world's wealthy people is really attainable for a lot of folks, but they have to understand the, the mechanics of it. And so this book will guide them through that. Yeah, definitely. And you mentioned before, sort of there was these six variables that, you know, you narrowed down to these, are, you know, you can get away with just analyzing these. So I'm not sure maybe if you can explain them and, you know, what is their value for investors or even for sort of people who are starting businesses? Okay, well, we'll start from the standpoint of the business entrepreneur, the, the person who's putting together a business uh, first. Um, and uh, uh, the six variables are these. Uh, the first one is uh, business investment. Um, and business investment is, um, is a financial term in the book and it's, it's defined. So uh, there's, a, there's a chapter devoted to business investment. So, um, but I'll, I'll say that, um, Business investment, broadly speaking, is anything a business has to buy with cash um, that is funded by either equity or what I call OPM, other people's money. Um, And the OPM, other people's money, is um, it could be borrowings. It could be money from um, leasing companies. For example, you you might choose to lease construction equipment or lease an airplane or lease real estate um, uh, rather than own it. Um, And and, and, uh, uh, my career has been spent doing the last thing. I, I, our companies bought tons and tons of real estate, uh, leasing them to real estate intensive businesses. It could be uh, retailers, it could be uh, veterinary clinics, early child education uh, and the like. And those companies had a problem to solve, which was they could either own the real estate or they could rent it from someone. And uh, from a corporate capital stack perspective, they're both totally viable options. And, uh, and so I spent a big part of my career convincing people they were much better off having a, a, lend, a landlord rather than a banker. Um, and 
Um, uh, and so these, this is really other people's money. I was part of the other people's money capital stack for people. Um, and so, uh, so when you're looking at uh, business investment, it's things funded with other people's money and also with equity. And, um, uh, and then you have sales. Sales are actually pretty obvious and that's pretty clean. And you don't really have to describe that too much. Um, uh, operating profit margin is the next one. And operating profit margin is um, the, basically the cash flow that the business is throwing off from its uh, operations uh, as a percentage of revenues. And, uh, and so obviously, since it's cash flow, it's before uh, depreciation, it's before amortization, it's before any sort of non-cash accounting conventions. Because what we're trying to do in the book is strip away non-cash accounting conventions and focus on the, just a pure finance of things. Because Finance is, is like music. It's a universal language. Accounting is not, you know. So uh, you in the UK are going to be using a lot of IFRS uh, accounting, uh, international accounting. The United States is going to be using a, a gap accounting. There are differences between these things. Um, uh, the book doesn't care about that. I mean, the book is focusing on just the pure finance of it. Um, and but the but one of the keys to operating profit margin is it has to be after uh, your compensation is taken out of it. If you're the owner of the company, uh, you have to include your own personal compensation out of that. It has to be a market wage um, uh, that's taken out of that so that the amount that's left over is the amount that's left over for shareholders um, uh, that gets dispersed. And so, um, uh, and so that's the third variable. The fourth variable is the percentage of the company that's funded with OPM. So um, some companies like Google have almost no OPM at all, and they're funded almost entirely with just equity. Uh, you know, uh, another FANG stock would be Netflix, which is funded much more with OPM and, and borrowings. And, and uh, uh, or you could have companies like Walmart in the United States, uh, a lot of the big retailers that are very asset heavy. Uh, use a lot of OPM, including uh, from, from companies like the one I used to uh, lead where uh, landlords are owning a lot of their real estate. And then uh, this, the uh, fifth variable would be the, the cost of that OPM. So what's the cost every year? I mean, uh, uh, the OPM is, uh, is your interest expense, it's your rent, uh, the lease rate. Um, and so is it 5%, 6%, whatever the, uh, the cost is. Um, and then the final uh, variable is the is what's called maintenance capital expenditure, which is um, also not really, uh, uh, you know, quickly described, but basically it is uh, the amount that a company is having to put back into the business every year just sort of to maintain itself. Um, but it could also include uh, smoothing things out. So for example, uh, if you're a consumer facing business, every four or five years, you may be doing a facelift on, on a property to try to uh, renovate it, uh, to bring it up to standards so that people um, don't think that the place is all worn out. I mean, uh, same thing could be done with hotels or whatever. I mean, you're, you're redoing all the rooms and whatnot. And, and uh, sometimes uh, people will describe such costs as being non-recurring costs, when in fact, they are recurring costs. They just are every five years or not every single year. Um, and um, and the other one I always like to think about is where uh, companies, especially if they're multi-location companies, oftentimes will uh, close down locations or relocate uh, 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 locations. And, uh, and you see this an awful lot, especially you know, in, in, in the US, you definitely see it a lot where um, uh, retailers or restaurant chains or uh, uh, large consumer facing enterprises have lo lots of locations, oftentimes will close down and relocate businesses. Uh, and when they do that, there's, a, there's often a cost to that. And I, I sometimes take that cost also into account uh, when calculating the business model. And the goal of linking all these variables with a simple equation is to calculate what's called a current uh, pre-tax, so you can do after-tax uh, return on equity, which is, you know, what, what are the equity guys getting today? What, what, what are the investors getting from this business today? And just from that number, you can then, um, move on to a whole host of things by estimating total rates of return to estimating uh, business values um, and the like. So it's amazing what you can determine from a simple equation. Yeah, I think in the book, you mentioned that 10% is sort of like the standard return on equity. So you, your goal as an investor or as a business is to try and have more than that, basically. Well, sure. I mean, if you, you know, my personal view was when I was leading uh, the companies I led was I was aware that uh, over uh, over its lifetime, the standard and poorest 500, which is a uh, broadly used uh, equity benchmark, uh, has delivered investors a rate of return somewhere in the neighborhood of 10%. Um, uh, if you're looking at the real estate investment trust benchmark, um, uh, 
and real estate investment trusts are a little bit more, they're a little different. They throw off more dividends and they uh, perhaps are a little bit slower growing, but uh, the return there for the last 20 years has been 9%. Um, but either way, let's say nine or 10% is, is sort of the, the floor. And if you're running a, a business, your goal is to generate a return on equity, a re return to shareholders that's more than that. Um, uh, if you don't, then what, what happens is your company just is worth what it costs to create. I mean, it's, it's delivering a nine or 10% ret return, which you know, people can get rich on nine or ten percent rates of return if they invest enough money. But um, but true wealth creation and, and having a company that's worth more than a cost to create only happens if you can deliver returns that are higher than that. And uh, uh, so in our case, we would be looking to generate total rates of return kind of in the twelve percent, thirteen percent range. Um, and and if you could do that, then you then you could create um, uh, a nice you know spread uh, in the business and be trading for let's say 30, 40 percent more than you were costing to to produce. Um, and for for real estate, that's actually a pretty solid number to be able to do that. Um, uh, but with with tech companies, the number of uh, the the amount you could be worth more than it costs to create is substantially higher than that. And um, uh, which is no surprise why why you see some tech titans being at the top of the richest uh, uh, people list. Yeah, definitely. So if we sort of look at that, you know, for me, I'm a finance student. I get given all these crazy <laughs> ways to analyze things, you know, models, everything like that. Six, only six variables seems quite, quite simplistic, but do you believe that that's maybe the mistakes that other people are making because they're overcomplicating their analysis? Well, I think that people tend to focus on um, uh, stringing together uh, absolute numbers and they, they focus on um, they, t they tend to get very complicated in their approach and they focus on things like net present value. So you'll say, um, uh, I think my cost of capital is this. And so I want to have a net present value that's higher than that. Um, I actually decided that cost of capital is kind of not really relevant. Um, uh, the thing that's really much more relevant is the cost of equity, you know, um, uh, and, you know, so I was always focusing on generating a return to my equity investors of north of 10%. Um, I, I was less mindful if my if my OPM investors, so if my, my lenders um, ended up making a premium on their investment to me, I, I was fine with that. Um, I didn't care. Um, uh, I was really focusing on, on the equity piece of it. And, uh, and so, um, so the, the goal is to uh, try to figure out what a company costs to create. And by the way, if you're an entrepreneur, you know exactly what a company costs to create. It's pretty simple. <clears throat> um, um, uh, and, and, uh, and then trying to have a company that's just worth <clears throat> more than that cost. And, um, and so if you can do that with a uh, return formula, which is an a relative number. So an equity return is a relative number, not an absolute number. So you're not focusing on net present values. You're not focusing on um, uh, average cost of capital or something uh, bizarre like that, then, then you're better off. And the other thing is that when people focus on um, uh, net present values, they're not, they're oftentimes not focusing about when the cash comes in. You know, I mean, they could be you know, zero, 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 and then you get all the cash at the end or something. So people um, uh, can come up with the, the notion that they can just do something because the net present value all pencils out, but not figure out, you know, when that money is going to be coming in. So uh, this is the timing of it and the source of it matters, you know? Um, and uh, so I, I think, yeah, people overcomplicate it. And, um, uh, and certainly uh, the entrepreneurs uh, that start businesses tend not to be math wizards, but they understand how much cash they have in the bank. They understand what things cost uh, and they understand what returns are and they understand what the equity investors are making. Um, and that's really kind of the essence you want to get down to when you're focusing on a business. And uh, I think sometimes we lost that. I went through uh, multiple years of business school education um, uh, and got out without really understanding why it was that some companies ended up being worth more than other companies and, you know, what the differences in business models were, you know, and uh, so I became over my career kind of an expert in, in business models. And that's what this formula does. Yeah, it's fascinating. I think you mentioned an example throughout the book where, you know, someone was, they, were, they had sales, they're making profits, but their issue was they were actually running out of cash. <laughs> they didn't have the cash because of, you know, they were promised cash in the future that to pay, you know, supply up front. So I think that's one of the things I've heard you say that one of the biggest mistakes is, you know, businesses make is running out of cash and uh, no question um uh i mean and uh, you can i can give stories of companies who uh never really reported much of a loss but they actually ran out of uh, cash and they went bankrupt um uh so so running out of you know, 
as a, as a banker, uh, that was always an adage, which is companies don't go out of business because they lose money. They, they go out of business because they run out of cash. And uh, um, indeed, that's important. Now, if you're an investor, you know, and, and uh, you asked about investing as well. I mean, um, if you're an investor, the, the thing is that when you're buying um, an equity um, and there are chapters on this in the book as well, um, you're not able if, you, if you're dealing with a, an entrepreneur who's created a great business, say you're dealing with. Uh, Sergey Brin and, and Larry Page, who started Google, um, uh, when that company went public, uh, the you know the normal mortal shareholders out there couldn't buy in at cost anymore. You know um, uh, that was lost to them, so they were buying at a multiple of cost because the the company was returning, you know, delivering rates of return that were higher than investors were going to require, and so basically the the in the initial investors were paying essentially ten times. Uh, the, the, the equity cost that uh, the initial founding shareholders had paid, uh, which, of course, vaulted uh, the initial founding shareholders into pretty stratospheric wealth uh, numbers, um, which only just went higher and higher over time. Um, and so when you're calculating returns on equity from an investor perspective, um, the, the variable that really changes is business investment, because uh, for the investor, uh, your business investment isn't the same as theirs. Uh, your business investment is much higher because you had to pay a marked up price for the company. And so your return on equity is a little bit lower. So uh, so you could take the exact same formula and you can look at it from the investor perspective. And uh, some companies trade for less than they cost to create, but the all, all the successful ones that you would know uh, tend to trade at a pretty solid premium. And uh, so this walks you through how to do that. Yeah, it's interesting. And I guess, you know, I, I think something that's, I mean, I guess, you know, someone that you mentioned before, Warren Buffett is, is renowned as saying is that, you know, you want to, if you want to buy a good company, you, you're going to have to pay a premium. He'd much prefer to do that rather than buying a bad company for cheap. And I guess that's something that you're saying there that these good companies, they might be more expensive compared to, you know, book value, the money invested, but there is that value there. Right. When well, it's all tied to returns, right? So, so, um, uh, so the returns are everything. I mean, uh, uh, what you what you're buying is 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 returns, um, and it's backed by some assets at cost. But those assets at cost really don't much matter anyway. Now it's funny in real estate companies, which I've run real estate companies, people spend a lot of time trying to figure out what the net asset value is of a real estate company or the assets at cost. And I think it's sort of a, a neat thing in the sense that you know what breakup value is for real estate companies, but. Um, but with most companies, you don't know what breakup value is. I mean, you have no idea um, uh, what a company would be worth if it were broken up into all of its pieces. Um, uh, so the thing that really matters is just the rates of return. So if you're if you're an equity investor, that's really what you're focusing on. And um, uh, and and uh, uh, you know Warren Buffett has made a habit out of investing in companies he both understands and buys at. Uh, the right time. A lot of times, one of the uh, investment adages is you, you know, the money's made when, when the investment is made, not when it's sold. So you're buying at the right time is also important for, for Mr. Buffett. Yeah, it's interesting. So you mentioned there, we, we obviously talk about the six variables. Are there any other variables that maybe once you've looked into that, that you're analyzing or? Well, the six variables can be can be disaggregated, so you can uh, so it's a simplification. So you can take the six variables and blow them out to be thirty or something if you wanted to uh, expand it. And there's there's a chapter in the book that walks you through that. Um, if there's a seventh variable that's really important, it's going to be taxes. Um, and uh, uh, and and uh, the taxes are important because as companies grow. Um, uh, if you take a return on equity, so let's say the current return on equity is 20% pre-tax. Um, if it's 15% after tax, let's say the taxes are 25%, just to be simple. Um, so if it's 15% it's, it's after tax, then basically that 15% becomes the maximum that company can grow um, uh, through new investments. So the company is going to have growth two ways. One is from the base business. So there's a base business delivered the 20% rate of return pre-tax and 15 after tax. But then the second source of growth is going to be taking that 15% and whirling it back in and compounding that rate of return. And so in theory, you can grow another 15% on top of that by reinvesting it. You know, um, If you pay out half that money in dividends, now you can only grow 7.5%. So companies have to think about 
how, how they're growing. And, and, uh, and the formula sort of walks you through that in terms of where the total rate of return can come from, both from sort of internal growth and also uh, external growth as you're kind of whirling that cash and, and compounding returns. And as, uh, uh, again, Warren Buffett or um, Benjamin Franklin or Albert Einstein would, would talk about the miracle of compounding as being one of the most uh, profound um, uh, forces in the universe, and, and indeed it is. And, and uh, most, you know, some of the most uh, highly performing companies, and certainly Berkshire Hathaway, doesn't pay a dividend now because it is trying to do uh, deliver returns, compounding the, the cash flows by reinvesting them. Yeah, which is super interesting. So you mentioned there before business models as well and how you've sort of been analyzing them for, for years. So if someone's an investor, I guess, what should they look at? To, what should they be analyzing with the business model? Is there anything in particular? Or, or? Well, yeah, you can, you can uh, actually, you can rank companies when you do this. I mean, you can um, uh, rank uh, uh, companies by looking at their business models. Now, uh, in today's marketplace, it's interesting because public companies and private companies trade by you know, two different rules. And in the private markets, people expect you to be throwing off cash flows. Um, uh, in public companies, oftentimes there are no cash flows and, and, and companies are trading at multiples of sales, so let alone cash flow, because there is no cash flow. Um, and uh, uh, so a, an iconic company like Tesla was actually public for 10 years before it started producing any cash flow at all. You know? um, and so, uh, in public companies, there's a risk where people are buying stocks, not really knowing the business model. So there, there's six variables, the business model, they don't really know what they are yet, you know? Um, and, uh, uh, and so if you're an investor like Warren Buffett, Warren wants to know what those six variables are. He wants to understand what, what the, you know, what makes the company work from a financial perspective. Um, today's investor oftentimes is looking at growth stocks, not, really mindful of what makes the company work and, and not understanding what the variables are. So um, uh, definitely the approach in this book, if you're an investor, is sort of a value stock type of approach. It's not going to be a growth stock approach. It's not going to be working for companies that are emerging growth companies where the investments are really um, uh, more akin to a venture capital uh, round and also um, an investment in a company where the, the, the ultimate business model really isn't known. Yeah, definitely. So I, I guess, do you, do you have a feeling that, you know, if we look at the market over the past year, we've had high inflation, you know, some of those growth stocks you were mentioning there have sort of been destroyed. Do you think that we could be going back to maybe a value overperforming or do you have any opinion on that? Or um, I, I think, I think uh, from a value trend, from a, from a, from a, investment style trend, uh, value is likely to, to play a bigger role over the next few years. Um, but one thing I know is that um, value investing ultimately tends to win out. You know, so water seeks its own level. Um, uh, business models win out. Um, uh, and you know, ultimately, uh, the stocks or the growth stocks today, where we don't really quite know what the business models are, um, uh, eventually, we're going to know what the business models are. Um, so, uh, and uh, the companies will become more seasoned, more mature. Uh, people will know what they are, and then uh, the the values will then start to reflect that. Um, and uh, so, if you're an investor and you're looking for uh, avoiding a lot of volatility and a lot of risk, um, uh, understanding the company that you're owning and what the business model is is a key way to do that. And um, uh, as as Warren Buffett would observe that when you're buying stocks, you know he would always view buying stocks as being wanting to be a partial owner of the company, you know, um, uh, uh, and today I think uh, a lot of people don't really think about whether they're owning a business or not, or how that business functions. Um, uh, and uh, uh, but that's the way a value investor would think, and uh, they'd be observing the six variables and uh, paying attention. Yeah, they're probably more thinking about the the profits they're going to make or the returns rather than the actual company right. <laughs> behind it. So if we look at, you know, we, as you said there, we mentioned the six variables, how they're really important to understand uh, when, when analyzing a company. Are there any red flags that people should be maybe aware of that or that you maybe when you do these six variables that you see and that could maybe push them away from actually investing in a company? Well, I think that in the near term, as companies are growing, uh, you can mask the six variables, um, and and there are different ways of masking the variables. Um, uh, uh, so, for example, I have seen companies where they've been trading at very, very uh, lofty price earnings multiples, um, and uh, rather than financing their, you know, using a capital stack and financing their balance sheet or using OPM uh, prudently, 
they've loaded up heavily on equity because it's cheaper to use equity than to use OPM. So for example, um, as, a, as a landlord, uh, we might have charged somebody uh, seven or eight percent a year or something for their lease. But if they're trading at a lofty P multiple, uh, their cost of equity alone might be three or four percent. So um, uh, so to you know increase earnings per share, you know, companies might be tempted to issue more and more equity uh, at the expense of actually having a prudent capital stack. So basically having a capital stack that's skewed more towards equity than it should be. Um, uh, so I think people can play uh, a lot of games in terms of uh, how companies get built. When I listed our first public company, we ran it for seven years and ultimately we sold it to GE Capital. Um, and uh, GE Capital was trading at a much loftier uh, multiple than we were. And so when they combined our multiple into their multiple, uh, all the GE shareholders actually benefited because uh, they, they could take our earnings and multiply them by their multiple in theory um, uh, and grow their earnings per share. Um, and this is basically what happened in the 1960s, um, uh, where you had the conglomerate boom, where companies were acquiring each other and just arbitraging multiples. But from a from a value equation perspective, the returns weren't really any better at all. I mean, <laughs> um, so you were basically uh, uh, creating the appearance of earnings growth without actually uh, having um, uh, the ability to generate higher levels of uh, returns on equity. And um, and so the result of that is that the uh, companies tended to, to, to crater. Uh, and during Jack Welsh's tenure at GE, he bought a thousand, no less than a thousand companies, um, uh, which is an extraordinary feat for somebody over a 20 year period of time. And, and that um, thousand companies greatly um, uh, improved uh, GE's earnings multiples or earnings numbers, uh, earnings per share, because you're buying uh, companies at, at lower multiples than the company the G was trading at, and um, and then later on, of course, uh, G stock uh, dropped and then uh, uh, subsequently fell, and the dividend was cut, and um, uh, and G Capital was disbanded, and um, uh, and G Capital was uh, taken off the Dow Jones uh, list of companies, and and so on. So you you can you can only mask this for so long um, uh, as you're doing it, and I think that uh, uh, the important thing about things like the value equation is to try to see through companies and what they're trying to do. Yeah. And I think one thing, as you said there, as, as well as the time, it, it always, you know, will reveal what happens. It'll always reveal if, you know, what the company is saying is correct or not. Uh, yeah. I mean, even for, I mean, conglomerates are, are insanely complicated from an investment perspective because there are so many lines of business that it's really hard to understand them and all the numbers are aggregated together. So you just don't know. Um, um, one of the amusing things, I gave a story in the book about uh, about selling out to GE. And when we sold to GE, um, uh, we were a real estate investment trust. Uh, and so basically, we became not a real estate investment trust. We were part of a C-Corp. Uh, but when, when you buy a company, you have to appraise the assets. You have to appraise the real estate. Um, and so... Um, uh, so we were asked by GE if, if we could have the real estate appraisal be as low as possible. Uh, so we instructed the uh, appraiser to uh, uh, be conservative on the valuations. And, um, and GE's objective here was because as a, as a uh, traded C corporation, um, they were graded on earnings per share. If they threw off a lot of depreciation on real estate, um, it would drag their earnings. So the lower the real estate was valued, the less depreciation they would have to report. Um, but the other thing was they could book a lot of uh, what's called goodwill. Goodwill being uh, the difference between the price they paid for the company and, and the actual value of the, the business. And goodwill, you didn't have to depreciate at all. You could just actually just let it sit there. So, um, so by having low valuations on real estate that were reported, they could actually increase their earnings. And so basically increase that arbitrage multiple that they had, had done. Um, and, uh, and they could make it even better because in the years that followed, they would occasionally peel off real estate and sell it to other people uh, for substantial profits. So, uh, and it made it, it was easier to sell it a substantial profit if you'd marked it low to begin with. Um, uh, and uh, uh, so it gives you an idea of how uh, accounting can just mask what's happening in reality and the investors just aren't totally mindful of this. Um, and years later, the irony was that we sold our second company to an entirely different group. Uh, this group uh, 
uh, was led by a company based out of your uh, uh, home uh, birth country, Australia, um, and, uh, and the Australians had, had bought a lot of assets from the United States. And, um, and so we sold to this group and they, their goal was to keep the real estate valued as high as possible when they were valuing it. So they, they asked for a much, much higher value. Um, and, uh, and, and so, so we, we did this. And so it gives you, and, and there were different, they, their agenda was to be able to raise capital from people and they didn't want to look like they paid too much for the real estate. So they wanted to make sure that the real estate was valued uh, uh, very high so that people thought they were getting a good deal when they were coming in and buying the real estate later on. And yet none of this changed one bit, the returns that the company was able to throw off on equity. Um, and, uh, and that's the important thing from an investor perspective. Yeah, I guess that links back to what you were saying before about accounting and how it could be different everywhere. And there's, there's no, not really that much consistency between countries. Uh, or, or even with the same accounting system, you know, using gap accounting, you can actually have two completely different results, right? Depending on how you do it. Yeah, definitely depends on what, what they want to do. Uh, so yeah, that's really interesting. So if we, if we look at the sort of, I guess, housing market at the moment, as you said, you've managed quite a few uh, real estate investment trusts. You know, it's quite tight, especially in the US. People are saying, you know, the prices have gone up quite a lot. Rentals, especially for, I guess, single homes and all that stuff has gone up as well. Do you have an opinion on where you see the market going uh, in the future? Or, Well, I think that as, as rates have been low, and this has been a global phenomenon, so as rates have been low for a very long time, and in the US, they've been, you know, very low, and in and, and much of Europe, they've been negative, you know. Um, uh, so, um uh, and low rates have a tendency to boost asset inflation. So while there's not been any um, monetary inflation as we see today globally, uh, there's been definitely a lot of asset inflation, um, uh, which is also, I think, equally, uh, you know, it's, it's also equally dangerous. And so um, with rising rates, hopefully that's going to temper some of the asset inflation that we've seen. Um, uh, and uh, you want to sort of have that Goldilocks moment where you get it all just right, hopefully, but we'll, we'll see what happens. But you want to raise, I think, I think it's important to raise rates. And, and you look at America in particular, uh, America has come out of COVID as uh, strong as anyone in terms of uh, uh, economic growth. And I think that uh, that's contributed to more inflationary pressures that, that exist in America than do in other places. So the, the headline number yesterday was eight and a half percent, which is the highest in 41 years. And um uh, and so there's going to be definitely a lot of pressure on um, uh, on regulators in the United States to um, elevate rates and to keep them um, you know, keep keep them manageable. I think uh, um, I think for the rest for for the for the uh, developed world, I think that having interest rates that are a little bit higher is probably not a bad thing. I mean, uh, I think it keeps asset values in line. I think it also makes it easier for people to invest for retirement and uh, and and to to make. You know, investments in fixed income securities, for example, which have been uh, so beat down in terms of uh, uh, the rates that you can uh, realize on them. So um, uh, which tends to push up stocks and push up more risk based assets. And uh, uh, so I actually welcome um, higher rates and, and hope that uh, it doesn't drive us all into too much of a recession. Um, uh, because if it does that, then the rates will come back down. Um, so let's just hope that uh, we, we have uh, you know some nice balancing act here, and we manage to uh, uh, corral inflation, but also at the same time um, uh, manage interest, uh, you know, manage uh, asset inflation as well. Yeah, definitely. Hopefully, our uh, people have heeded the warning of the interest rates. And so I think a lot of people they they might not even believe it that it's going to go. You know, I think the Fed have mentioned they're potentially going to go seven, eight, nine hikes. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the risk that maybe people are, you know, they're still risk on. And if they, the Fed actually go through with it, then, you know, we could see further downside. Well, when I started my career, um, I, it was under the Volcker administration running the Fed. And uh, we had inflation that was double digits in the United States. And this was in the late 70s, early 80s. And, um, uh, and the uh, prime short-term borrowing rate hit 21%. Um, uh, the ten-year Treasury hit ten percent. Uh, I mean, today the ten-year Treasury is at uh, you know one one eighty or something like that. Um, uh, I think that the rates that you're talking about that happened early in my career would drive uh, economies into uh, uh, substantial reversals and may not even be sustainable. Um, uh, so I don't see any return to that kind of um, number, but. Uh, but, but I think that there's definitely room to, to elevate rates. And the long-term average for the 10-year treasury over a long period of time has been around 4.5%. Um, will it get there? I don't know. I doubt it. Uh, but uh, uh, not, not too hard to see a three.
So, yeah, I guess we've seen the trend over the, as you said, the past 40 years where it's just been going, <laughs> going down. So yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, we'll see if it goes up. So if we sort of look back at your investing career, is there any advice or that really stands out or, you know, I guess what would be the best piece of advice you've received? Um, well, um, you know, I think that one of one of my mentors was uh, uh, a gentleman who was a consummate entrepreneur, and and, uh, and he would say availability of capital is everything. Um, and um, uh, and I think that uh, as we've run businesses over the years, we've taken that to heart, uh, so that uh, when we've had our stock poorly valued over the years from time to time, we've uh, still issued new stock and raised capital. We thought we could deploy the money. Um, uh, and we haven't really worried about um, uh, or been uh, uh, deterred by the fact that the stock uh, was, was trading uh, at a low price and the price of capital was really high. Um, and um, availability of capital is everything and, and liquidity is everything. And uh, uh, so uh, and then, of course, finally, I think that uh, uh, goes without saying the business models are everything. And, and the book itself focuses very heavily on um the different kinds of business models that exist and, and, uh, uh, and what it takes to make a company that's going to be um, adding value and not just worth what it costs to create. Yeah, su- super great advice. So uh, Chris, thanks again for joining the podcast. And I guess my last question, what is one message you want people to take away from the book? Is it to look at business models or is there something else? Well, I think it all has implications for, um, for for the world, if you if you look at uh, returns on equity, I mean, I think returns on equity are the foundation of free enterprise system, um, uh, and uh, they're what make the free enterprise system better than any alternative, um, and that's what drives um, uh, the allocation of capital, and uh, uh, and so it's wise for governments and politicians to try to minimize their involvement with this and to make you know to let business work what it does. Um, in the United States, which has been sort of a paragon of free enterprise um, economy, I mean, it's a country with 4% of the world's population. Um, it's had the biggest economy since 1871. Uh, it's got about 22% of global GDP, um, and it has about 30% of the world's wealth. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and that has a lot to do with uh, being able to focus on the rule of law and having a solid free enterprise system, which can make com- you know countries ex- you know just exceptional. And of course, um, uh, the UK is uh, also just hugely represented in terms of uh, ha- having a population of about 67 million, uh, million people uh, and, and being uh, ranked in, in, in among the world's greatest economies. And so the free enterprise model is important and it, and it really does start with uh, current equity returns, which drive the entire um, uh, the, the entire thing. Yeah, and I guess we've seen the risks that are uh, potentially investing in other countries that don't have that, <laughs> especially in the past few years. What that well, that's led to with return on equity uh, in China. Yeah, right. It's it's what's hard for countries to uh, to ascend unless they have those ingredients. Yeah, perfect. Thanks so much, Chris. So uh, as we mentioned there, the the book's going to be released. 10th, 10th of May. So I'll put all the links down in it below uh, if anyone wants to buy it. And if anyone else wanted to maybe uh, keep up to date with your work and what you release, would that be through LinkedIn or is there any other way for that? Um, yeah. So uh, uh, there will be a website, which is called the value equation.com. Uh, and so if you open it up today, it'll just say something cool is coming. Uh, it is coming. Uh, uh, the book's supposed to be out by May 10th. So the website should should uh, start to have some appearances before then. There'll be a way to get in touch with me then. Um, I am on LinkedIn. So if you want to try to reach me through LinkedIn too, I, I will look at that too. Perfect. I'll put all the descript- uh, all of them in the description below. So Chris, thanks again for your time. Anthony, pleasure. Thank you so much for listening. And if you enjoyed the episode, please subscribe and click the bell icon so you are notified when new podcasts are released. I hope you're leaving with some great value about investing, trading, and finance. See you on the next show.